I bought a brand new MLB team and relocated them to Alaska, and as you can expect, the journey of the polar bears has not been easy. We were the laughing stock of the league for our first few years in existence, but I truly believe that all changes today entering season 5. Last season, we were two wins away from our first playoff berth in team history, and while it was very frustrating to fall short, we drafted one player who I really believe can get us to October. Greg Duke was hands down the best pitching prospect I had ever seen, and we were lucky enough to get him at the number two pick, so him, along with our biggest free agent signing ever in Mike Soroka, give us a much stronger rotation. Then on offense, we saw a breakout rookie of the year campaign from former number one pick LJ Morales, who not only had an amazing first year, but he's only gonna get better with 99 potential. However, while everything suggests that we're on the right path, there are still so many questions for this team making the playoffs, because winning this division is going to be a full team effort, and over our first few years of existence, we have not seen enough of this core play well to win the big games. Players like third baseman Tyler Locklear have certainly flashed, but have not done enough to earn a future on this team, while we also need someone like Bobby Dahlbeck, whose excellent past performance did earn him a contract extension to bounce back after a rough year. There's a lot on the line entering our fifth year of existence, as many of our core players are set to start regressing, so if we fall short again, we're gonna be forced to make some tough calls. It has been so fun letting you guys rename my draft picks, because the creativity in the comments of every video has been awesome, so while I can only choose a few names per video, please keep the suggestions coming. Without further ado, here are some of the name changes for this year's round of draftees, but if you want to see all seven of them, they are in the description below. Most importantly though, number two overall pick Greg Duke, who I was just talking about, changed his name to Mac Badger, but he's also joined by other A potential prospects like Kodiak Stormwalker and Ziggy Donovan. Entering spring training, our farm system now has 17 top 100 prospects, and while many of our top potential guys are still pretty far from the majors, guys like Donovan Bear III and Nelson Wang have a chance to debut this year. However, one of those top prospects, Mac Badger, will play right away, and obviously in my franchises, it's very rare for someone to play right away, so he definitely has a lot of talent. However, there will be growing pains in his first spring training game, but he's also shown a lot of positives so far, so I'm not worried quite yet. I'm giving him one more inning as he strikes out Mustafa Martinez, and if you remember him, he was my favorite prospect in the entire draft two years ago, who ended up going number one. Max able to go out on top, but now Griffin Judd gets shelled, so even against Colorado, our pitching's not playing well, and we have no hits, and I know it's only the first spring training game of the year, but this team really has high expectations. It is fitting that Morales got our first hit of the year, because last season, at only 19 years old, he carried our offense, and at one point, was leading for the MVP. He just scored our first First run of the year, and Tyler Locklear is going to add a lot more with a two-out, three-run home run. We took the lead in just two at-bats, and I already brought up Tyler Locklear as one of the keys to our season, because he's been showing sparks ever since his rookie year, but has really struggled to take that next step. Just like so much of our lineup, he has power for days, but he's proven to be a real strikeout machine, and that trend alone has caused him and Bobby Dahlbeck to fall down the lineup in favor of guys like LJ Morales, and I would say that's paying off for this team. I've been playing a spring training game per year for the entire franchise just to get a preview of this team, but so far this one is the most exciting ever as both sides are digging into their bench and still scoring runs. In the end though, third year closer Avi Tick gets the save, and while it certainly wasn't a perfect win, we saw a lot of positives to bring in to opening day. Our first game of the year is on the road against Boston, and right off the bat, Dyron Blanco goes deep into left center field, that bounces off the top of the green monster, and he definitely has extra bases, but for some reason decides to go for three, and I don't think that's gonna work out for him. He opens the year in exciting fashion, but it's a little unfortunate he went for extras, because there's no doubt that LJ Morales would have scored him. There are two aboard for Tyler Locklear, who strikes out, so we were unable to score a run in the first inning, thanks to Blanco's mistake, and here's Rafael Devers, who has a base hit, except he's trying to go for two. I don't think that's a good idea, as the throw is in time. Time. That is going to even out our mistake as Joe Adele goes the other way. So early on, we found some momentum against Whitlock, but still have not scored a run. Even with the addition of Mac Badger, Griffin Judd's still our opening day starter until proven otherwise as Salas lays down a bunt that actually works. It is not common to see a catcher lay one down like that, but he immediately gets thrown out. And in the fourth inning, we still have not seen our first run of the day. Judd's playing like a guy who knows he has competition, but until we get some run support, we're 
we're in danger of wasting his gem. If we lose today, we can certainly point to Dyron Blanco's huge mistake, because choosing to go to third cost us a run early on in the game that we're just now getting back. Regardless, we get it done, and now Tolieri just one at bat later drops an opposite field blooper, so it seems we finally have some momentum again as Forsyth does fly out to opposite field, but that's a sacrifice fly. That was a great inning, and Griffin continues to cook, while Boston has already put in their bullpen, guys, so it is very clear we have the advantage. It would be so cool for Griffin Judd to go seven shutout innings in his first start of the year, and right now, that is looking very feasible, as there's just one to go, and Dyrone Blanco redeems himself. A double put two runners in scoring position, and we scored both of them on sacrifice flies, so not only are we up six runs, but we have not hit a dinger. We have been playing small ball for this entire game, and it's really working out, as we were very over-reliant on big plays last season, which ultimately cost us the playoffs. Judd continues to be one of the best pitchers in the league, as he just caught that behind his back for the out, so really for one of the first times of the series, it feels like this is a complete team effort, instead of just a couple guys. There is no better way to start this season than with a big W, as Tyler Locklear is gonna make the final out, and we complete a big time shutout win. That was a beautiful eight inning performance from Griffin Judd, and even though the rest of our offense kinda took time to get going, it was very exciting to see pretty much our entire starting lineup get on base. It is very rare for me to play out two games in the same series this early on, but I'm doing exactly that for Mac Badger's debut. So far, so good for the very talented rookie, but he gives up his first hit, so he welcomes him to Major League Baseball, but that is a very smooth recovery. I would love to get him a win, but our offense is gonna have a rough day against Garrett Crochet, so we're counting on Badger to have a great MLB debut, and he just allowed another hit. Just like we saw in the spring, he might need some time, but unlike Judd and pretty much any other pitcher on our team, Badger has extremely good strikeout ability, which is gonna make things a lot easier. We are still scoreless in inning number three, but I spoke too soon because Freddy Tallieri goes deep for our first dinger of the year. He is not bad for an undrafted catcher, but more than anything, I feel like Crochet just made a mistake. That gives us the lead and takes pressure off of Badger, as we are seeing his strikeout ability, but now Mazutake Yoshida drives this one into right field, staying fair all the way over the fence. Our lead did not last long, and here's another home run, so this has not been the game-breaking debut we may have been expecting, but Adele is rolling in the deep with a deep two-run blast. After a shutout performance with no dingers, both sides have been going back and forth, and this one even scaled the green monster. After losing their momentum, the polar bears are right back in the driver's seat, as we've caught Crochet off his game, and there's a chance to add more runs, as there are two guys on for LJ. He has a shot to break this game wide open, but that's not gonna happen, so it's time for Badger to lock it back down, but Mazataka Yoshida has certainly not been his friend today, as he's already homered to right field, and this time, he's going to hit a ground rule double. The tying run is now in scoring position, but fortunately, we get out of it. And here's William Trout, who's had a quiet start to the year, but every polar bear has to come out of hibernation eventually, and he does exactly that. Do polar bears even hibernate? I honestly couldn't tell you, but we're gonna roll with it because it sounded cool, and here's another run. So Badger has a massive cushion. It may not be a shutout, but he's still in a very good spot with two runs given up. However, Tristan Casas is going to change that with a deep drive into straightaway center. I know many of you already plan on commenting player names below, but also while you're at it, tell me one polar bear who you think is gonna have a good year. This might seem like a very simple question, but consistency has been a huge issue with so many players on the squad, so no matter who it is, your guess is as good as mine. Avi Tick is one player we need to be consistent, because while he did make an all-star game last year, his second half was not nearly as good, and he took a huge fall off. However, right now, he's really locked in, so he's looking to put that second half of the season behind him by earning his first save of the new year and helping Mac Badger secure his first career win. These first couple games have really shown us a little bit of everything with this team, as after not hitting a single home run in game one, we had three today, and our offense was just as electric, putting up 11 hits. It also feels like this Griffin Judd and Mac Badger one-two punch could be the future of this team, which I'm very excited about. Just like last season, we're trying to start our season out on the right note, and the best way to do that is getting as many wins as we can. And now in our second series of the year, we're looking to stay undefeated. We're tied up in the eighth, on the road against the Mets, and if our pitcher's duel continues, we're going to extras. Jose Suarez is just one out away from sending us to the ninth inning, but that pitch was not in the
in the right spot, and Brett Beatty's gonna make him pay for it. One bad pitch is all it takes to change this game, so now the Polar Bears have their backs against the wall, going up against Edwin Diaz. Not long ago, we were up 2-1, to one, but New York came back, scoring 3 unanswered, and would hand us our first loss of the year. Obviously, it's early on, but our offense cannot slow down, because just like we saw last year, this division's gonna be very competitive. Now we're playing our first home game of the year, and if you look around, you'll notice there's something very different about our stadium. After playing in a literal ski resort for our first four years, we finally upgraded as we're trying to win our first game in Polar Bear Park. Avi Tick is trying to close this one out, and after striking out Aaron Judge, that would be very easy to get done as we rebound against one New York team to beat another. However, we need to win the whole series if we want to stay on top in the division, and if we can win this game, we have a chance to do exactly that as with the bases loaded, Blanco hits this into the shallow outfield, and while I don't think it's deep enough for a sack fly, Bobby Dahlbeck is taking off anyways, and that's a huge mistake. Even though he's surprisingly athletic for a slugging first baseman, he should not have gone, so another base running mistake keeps us down by one, and we are rapidly running out of chances here in inning number eight. I am very fortunate we just got a base hit, but it's not gonna matter if Locklear whiffs at another meatball, but he makes up for it and ties this game. We are now in such a good position as the home team, as Joe Adele follows up by smoking us down the line for the go-ahead double, but there's still a chance to do even more damage with one away, and Dahlbeck does exactly that. A come-from-behind four-run rally wins the Polar Bears their first home series, and it's now time to get our first look at this draft class, where we might be picking a little later at number 18, but I feel that having eight draft selections will more than make up for that. The reason we get an extra first-round pick is because LJ Morales won Rookie of the Year, and we didn't manipulate his service time, so if you were curious as to why I made Mac Badger an opening day starter, that is the exact line of reasoning. From my experience, it's a little difficult for a pitcher to win Rookie of the Year, but I truly believe he can defy the odds if he performs anywhere near his full potential. I really hope this draft class is deeper than our last one, because while getting Mac Badger at number two overall certainly made everything worth it, it was still probably the thinnest class we've had yet, and I do not want to repeat. After sweeping New York, our homestand continues against the Toronto Blue Jays, and up one, LJ Morales just hit a double, so with none away, it seems our inning is just getting started, and right on cue, William Trout's gonna send him home. Just like last year, we are off to a very hot start, but the difference this season is I feel like we can actually sustain this, because if you remember in season four, we won so many of those games off of luck and unsustainable performances, and looking at our numbers early on in this season, I feel like that has not been the case so far. We can credit so much success to our new improved starting pitching, but unlike at this time last year, where we led the league in home runs, we're only 10th, and our team ERA is third in all of baseball. I know it's really early, but I think I might have already found the player I want to take with our first round pick, as Adrian Barton has guaranteed high potential, and while there's still a lot of time for scouting, I'm not going to overthink it this year and just go with the best available player. Thanks to their brand new elite pitching staff, the Polar Bears have started out the season 15-3, and and while that certainly has given us an early advantage in the West, there is way too much competition in this division for us to take our foot off the gas. However, with two on base, our offense just missed a big opportunity to take the lead, and because Mac Badger's on the mound, we need a win more than ever. I made it very clear that we're trying to win Badger Rookie of the Year to earn us an extra draft pick next season, but the huge challenge is when it comes to weighing awards for a pitcher in this game, win-loss record is probably the most important stat. Even if we get the win, Badger might not be credited for it, so ideally, we need a run right now. There's already one on, but here's a deep fly out, so there are two outs for Tyler Locklear, who gets the job done, going the other way into right center field, which will finally break the tie. That is very good for the Mac Badger for Rookie of the Year campaign, but now Bobby Dahlbeck's gonna make it even sweeter as we bury them with a three-run inning, and our Wonder Boy Mac Badger secures a shutout victory. However, after that performance, he is still not in the conversation, which tells me the Tigers are paying off the associated press, but despite getting screwed, we're still winning a lot of games. Winning awards is just a small side quest in the overall purpose of this season, which is to finally make the playoffs, and winning another series against Milwaukee would be a huge step to do that. Unfortunately though, Blanco got caught stealing with two outs, and now Milwaukee is starting to cook, as we may have just tied the game, but they're gonna get their lead back on this ridiculous suicide squeeze. If that were the Polar Bears, that ball would have bounced directly to their pitcher, but now we missed out on a double play, and of course, now a season one Polar Bear has a chance to put this game away, and his name is Juan Yepes. Looking at the stats, he's actually having a 
pretty good year with a 916 OPS as there are runners at the corners, but he swings and misses at strike three. If you remember, I let that guy walk because we had a huge log jam with Bobby Dahlbeck and William Trout. So him giving us a loss by himself would have been really bad karma on my end. Now we have a chance to get right back in this, but it seems Milwaukee has a secret weapon. Facing Felix Bautista is a nightmare and unfortunately he gets the best of us. So just like we saw so much last season, we crumbled the minute we saw a good team. Not only did they beat us once, but they won the series. And while our pitching has been pretty solid for the most part, I think our offense is really starting to lose its groove. At this point last year, LJ Morales wasn't just leading for rookie of the year, but also the MVP. So with a batting average of 222, I'm a bit worried this could be a sophomore slump. While that is certainly disappointing, he is far from the most disappointing player on the team so far, as that title might go to one of the most loved players on the entire team, William Trout. A 169 average and no power will not cut it for your slugging first baseman. So it's time for several players to figure it out, entering a brand new series against Boston, and you've got to be kidding me, that is a home run. That is not the first time Jose Suarez has let me down in a game this year, but on paper, he's still playing really well, so I think I'll just draw it up to bad luck. But if we lose today, this loss certainly falls on him. However, Crochet continues to walk us, so Boston is already going to their bullpen, and I think we all remember how that worked out in the first series of the year. Bobby Dahlbeck's third home run of the year is a three-run shot, and while this isn't the green monster the Sox fans are used to, Bobby went more than deep enough to make the Sox fans feel it. Unfortunately, though, they tied it back up, but here's Locklear, who's had a pretty good season, and while he grounds into a double play, it will score a run. It would be so helpful to add another run, but that is not going to happen. So now we really need our bullpen to hold strong. As there are two outs in the top of the eighth, Doug Forsyth has to make a tough play, which he makes with no problem. Unless we score another run, it is all going to come down to Avi Tick, as here's a double play. So we're counting on our young closer again. Just like last year, he's off to a hot start, but we really need him to stay consistent. Because if you remember, he collapsed down the stretch last year, and you've got to be kidding me with two outs, Rafael Devers ties it up. That is the first run he has given up all season, and I think the most annoying thing about that is he threw that ball right where the catcher wanted him to. That is a rough break for the Polar Bears, but we still have a chance to salvage this and turn it into a signature win as Dahlbeck keeps this fair down the left field line, and fortunately, we get out of that one unscathed. That walk-off hit might have been a nutsack hair away from going foul, but I'm certainly glad it stayed on our side, as Tick doesn't earn a save, but he does get the win, and we won the series. We have a five-game division lead entering the month of May, and I truly believe that the night and day difference from our starting pitching this year versus last year is making all the difference. Coming into the year, we had five quality options, which pretty much led James Nanook straight into the bullpen, and while he showed flashes in his first year as a starter, his second was a complete nightmare, so it's really nice to see him excelling in a role in the bullpen. In just one year, we've turned probably our biggest weakness into our biggest strength, but I'm a little concerned if it's gonna be enough because on offense, I'm seeing a lot of snowflakes. My fears are being realized in our very next game as we're losing to the Chicago White Sox. But after advancing a runner to third, I have a trick up my sleeve as Freddie Talieri is one of the best bunters on our team. With the game deadlocked at two apiece, we have a chance to walk it off. And at least in my mind, there's no one better to do that than the guy who's been struggling all season as William Trout saves the day and gets us a huge signature win. We nearly lost this game to Chicago, but in the end, we were able to hold our ground. And as they say, those are the moments where champions are made, so I'm feeling very optimistic about our future. We just finished our scouting and discovery on all of our international pitchers, and we may have found a diamond in the rough in Juan Rivera, who our discovery scouts did a great job of digging up, and he's the number six player in the class. He looks like a great late round selection, but if we've learned anything in this series, it's that you always need a backup plan, because you never know what's gonna hit you. Just based on his name alone, I'm not sure if Orlando Beach would be a great fit in Alaska, but just looking at him as a player, he has high potential and throws pretty hard. We're closing in on our first division series of the year, but right before we do that, we're taking on the team that has three finalists for AL Rookie of the Year. There's no doubt this is Mac Badger's most important start as a polar bear, and he's taking it personally, because winning this game would show the entire world who the real Rookie of the Year is, and he's locked in. Badger is one strike away from going seven scoreless, and if for any reason he's not the rookie of the year frontrunner after this, something's very wrong. I know this might seem like a dumb side quest, but I really want that draft pick, and apparently so does Badger.
manager because he told Dave Roberts he wants to stay in for the shutout. That is another victory for our phenom. And there's no doubt in my mind that this type of season deserves consideration for rookie of the year. But as you can see, the press has other ideas pushing a guy who's hitting 222 on the year. This would be a very funny turn of events, but I think the guy might have a higher chance of winning the Cy Young than rookie of the year at this point. And while that would be hilarious, I'm pretty sure that we would also get a draft pick for that. No matter what kind of hardware we do take home, we're getting an amazing rookie year from Mac Badger, as him and Griffin Judd have become one of the best pitching duos in the game. So even though my goal coming into this season was to make the playoffs, we cannot afford to blow the season they've given us. Right now, we're on pace to take another loss to Minnesota, but right on cue, Joe Adele blasts this one to center field. So this is suddenly only a one-run game at home. The tying run is on first base, as Nunez is gonna go the other way, and the cool thing about him is he has a lot of power in his bat for a shortstop and watches this one go over the fence. I am constantly reminded that the high elevation makes this one of the friendliest hitter parks in all of baseball and how fitting that Randy Arozarena reminds me again. Avi Tick misses out on another save and what a catch at third base as Royce Lewis just saved a huge double but it's not gonna matter as William Trout goes deep and that is another walk-off home run for the Polar Bears. Trout's numbers have not been great this season but he delivers when it matters as that is his second walk-off of the season and the Polar Bears are still on a roll. And all the excitement, it's been a while since we checked out scouting, so I'm gonna do exactly that. And as you can see, it looks like we found the best player in the entire class. Usually I don't draft a lot of first round pitchers, but to be fair, the ones that I have taken in this series have worked out pretty well. So in the scenario where Lincoln Ortiz falls to number 18, I think I'm gonna take him. After that, there's kind of just a lot of early round starters, relievers, and closers. So while I'm not surprised, this first round is looking a lot weaker than I expected, as so far there's only one position player I'd even consider drafting, and that is Adrian Barton. Don't get me wrong, I would love to take Adrian Barton, but as we've seen throughout this franchise, usually when I want a player, they do not fall to me. And while I do think he's gonna be a good player, elite offensive talent is way harder to come by. It's fair to assume that after this year, we're never gonna pick this early in the draft ever again. So even though we're picking at number 18, it is so essential that we make the most of it, and William Trout is starting to heat up. It is so encouraging, he's back to 700 OPS on the year, because out of anyone on this team, it feels like his performance has the biggest effect on our offense. When Trout's on his game, it feels like our entire offense just rallies around him, and that five-run inning to sweep Chicago is even more proof, as our confidence is at an all-time high, entering our first division series of the year. The Astros may be dead last in our division, but that does not matter, because as we saw last year, this entire division is loaded. Winning the series will set the tone for every other division series of the season. And down one, we're in a pretty good spot against Mason Miller, but Trout grounds into a double play. That will bring us down to our final chance. But after two fast outs, we need Bobby to step up. A righty-righty matchup is not ideal here, but it's already a 3-1 count and Bobby walks. So all it really takes is a huge double to score him all the way from first base. And on the first pitch he sees, Tallieri does exactly that. The Kings of Clutch have struck again at the very last moment, and we all knew this was a very important game, but right now we're looking at one of the best of the entire season as that gets through and scores the go-ahead run. However, we are certainly not done, as Avi Tick is up against Jordan Alvarez and catches him looking. Fortunately, the ump made the right call, as our biggest threat is off the board, and after a rough couple weeks, Avi Tick rebounds to earn a big-time save. Griffin Judd is on the mound for our next game, and just like he always does, he is making light work of this lineup, so we're just one win away from a sweep, which Mac Badger's gonna help us secure. On top of that, this guy's finally in the rookie of the year race, but honestly, I don't know if I trust him winning because a 9-0 start is really not sustainable. Him and Griffin Judd are trying to break Houston's streak of three Cy Young winners in a row, as they've dominated the awards in this franchise, but it looks like Jordan's not gonna win his fourth straight MVP. With a team like that, you would think that Houston is our biggest threat this season, but that might actually actually be Los Angeles, as Mike Trout is healthy and they're exceeding expectations. After a scoreless inning from former Angel Jose Suarez, we are tied up, so right after seeing some drama in Houston, we are going back to extra innings. However, Jose Soriano is one of my least favorite pitchers to go up against in this game, so with Thompson at third, I'm trying a sacrifice bunt, but that did not work. The reason I can't stand him is because of the movement of this pitch right here, but thankfully we make contact and Bubba is in safe. That is what speed does for your baseball.
baseball team, and we have plenty of it across the board. So despite only having one lefty in our entire lineup, we find a way to score. Now we can sit back and trust Tick to end this. And while I'm holding my breath with Mike Trout at the plate, we're able to jam him to get our first victory of a series that we win. Our mission to keep Mac Badger undefeated continues as we're down one run to the Tigers, but not for long. That is a three run shot from Joe Adele. So we are right back in the driver's seat. But of course, my goal is to leave no doubt and LJ Morales does exactly that. Not long ago, Mac Badger was looking at his first loss of the year, but we completely turned things around as our offense exploded for 10 unanswered runs, which was very impressive, even though Badger did not earn the win. Even though that left his record at 9-0, I do have some very good news as he's finally in his rightful place on top of the pack for AL Rookie of the Year. Him and Griffin Judd have been amazing, but it seems the rest of our rotation is also really carrying their weight, and most notably, James Nanook is really embracing his role in the bullpen. Then on offense, despite his struggles, William Trout is our first player to 10 home runs, and after having a pretty mediocre 2027, Doug Forsyth is now in contention for the batting title. We are finally taking on the Texas Rangers to open the month of June, and after finishing last in our division, they're now in second place. Badger's got his hands full with a very good lineup, and there's no doubt he deserves a ton of credit for holding Vlad Jr., Corey Seager, Evan Carter, and Adolis Garcia to two runs. However, at the same time, they've locked us down, so we're tied up in the seventh, and we're very lucky a throwing error to first keeps this inning alive, as there are two aboard for former Ranger Bubba Thompson, who wastes the opportunity. Then right after that, James Nanook gives up a home run, so we're officially in a bit of trouble, but have a runner in scoring position. From experience, I'm almost expecting a Trout nuke, but instead, he fouls off a pitch, and now Josh Young somehow doesn't make that play. We are very lucky to have two guys on, and now Joe Adele is going to help us out by hitting this more than deep enough for a sack fly. So we are tied up, and as you guessed it, we're going to extra innings with another division rival. You cannot make this up, and now we're trying to end it as good contact goes straight to Garcia, so there's two away for Trout, who strikes out looking. So far, this is our third division game that's gone to extra innings this year, but unlike the last two, we are not going to win this one as Evan Carter puts us away. Their home field advantage gives them the walk-off win, and now I'm simulating game number two, which ended up being a dominant win, all thanks to Mike Soroka and the middle of this lineup. That means the winner of game three will take the series, and right now, Alaska has a one to nothing lead in the eighth inning. One more run could put them away, and while Trout does make good contact, we only have three hits on the game. So once again, this series is in the hands of Avi Tick. Josh Young could be his final out, and after a nasty curveball, we're gonna freeze him and pick up another victory. We have now won a series against every single one of our division rivals, minus Seattle, but first we're taking on the Angels again, and we take the lead in the sixth inning, but in the seventh, LA comes back with a huge three-run bomb. A misplaced fastball is gonna cost us, as we're trailing by two runs and are running out of time. However, we're in a pretty good spot as Joe Adele just loaded the bases against his former team, and there's still none gone for batting title leader Doug Forsyth, who hits into a double play. We will score a run, but miss a huge opportunity to take this lead back, but fortunately for us, we have two innings to score one run, and William Trout's gonna start off with a double. Just like last inning, we have runners on base, but of course, here comes the double play. So we're down to our last chance, but we're facing a closer who only has an 82 mile an hour fastball. Let me just point out that this is one of the things that I really want MLB The Show to fix, because most real life closers have very high velocity, and considering these are premier prospects in the draft, it's pretty unrealistic. Every single pitch is coming to us in slow motion, but even then, our runner heading home home gets thrown out, so we strand another guy in scoring position, but thankfully the game is not over yet. An intentional walk loads the bases, but they were smart to put in a new pitcher. Unlike Nakajima, Carlos Hernandez can actually throw gas, so the game's on the line for Bubba Thompson, and even though it was an off-speed count, I swing anyways, and the Polar Bears lose. I try not to swing at bad pitches, but that time the pressure got to me, so the Polar Bears have lost four out of their last five games, which is a little concerning. Thankfully for us, we're taking a break with a slow series against the Rockies, and even though we're down one to nothing in the seventh inning, we're gonna rally back with two runs on this single. Four unanswered runs will win us the series, but there's still one more game to play as we earn the sweep. What a way to bounce back as we earn our 50th win, and while our core offensive players have gotten back on track, I'm a little worried about all of these snowflakes in the rest of the lineup. However, when it comes to our rotation, I have zero concerns as we're leading baseball in Team ERA, and it really feels like there's no weak
weaknesses, as even our worst guys Mike Soroka and Jairo Iriarte would be starters on other teams. It is finally time for our first series of the year against Seattle, and they won our division last year. So regardless of what our records are this season, they are a very important team to beat. We are tied up at one apiece in the seventh, and we have a great opportunity with two guys on and now one out. We cannot afford a double play in this spot, but right as I'm explaining that, we swing at a terrible pitch. So continuing our trend from last game, we are allergic to home plate, but we better get over it fast because we have another two guys on. That is two hits in a row, and now make it three as Forsyth loads the bases, but given how we've been playing, we're gonna find a way to mess this up. I'm gonna be so mad if we blow this chance with zero away, because while it might not make a difference in the regular season, we cannot afford to fall apart in the playoffs. That will give Avi Tick a two-run cushion to add another save to his resume, and I'm certainly glad we have that extra run. It is such a great privilege for a closer to give up a nuke and not even care, as that is save number 30, and as you probably could have guessed, that does lead the MLB. Another victory would give us the series win, and right now we're shutting them out, but have offered no run support. Our bullpen has really stepped up lately, but I still want to add one more run, and this could be our chance to do it as the bases are loaded, which will bring up Joe Adele, who goes the opposite way with plenty of power, carrying into right field, going all the way back to the wall for a grand slam. There's that Alaska elevation once again doing us favors, as there's absolutely no doubt we were late on that pitch, but in the end, it does not matter, as we shut out Seattle 5 to nothing. That will secure the series win and the sweep, as we are on pace to have the best record in baseball history. Just like we were hoping for, five quality starting pitchers has made the difference on a team that is completely 180'd, but I never expected the results to look like this. This is the first time this team has been consistently dominant, and even though we still find ourselves in a lot of close games, we're finally winning them. This has made all the difference, especially in our conquest of the AL West, as even though it's early July, we have not lost a single series to a team in our division. We really should have scored the first run of the day, but Thompson got caught stealing, so instead of being out in front, there are two outs, but just like always, we find ways to get runners on base, and we scored one of them. We grinded out another late lead, and Avi Tick secured us the victory, so we secure another division win, and while that might not seem like a big deal, our division is loaded, so it's a great test for the playoffs. This will be our final series before the draft and the all-star break, and while the Rangers did just take the lead, we have a runner on second, but we're sending him home immediately with a deep shot to straightaway center field. They left that dead center over the plate, so Tyler Locklear sent it right back up the middle, and with our new stadium, I feel like we haven't seen as many home runs this season, so that one felt really nice. They took the lead, we got it back, and then they tie it up, so an American League West team may be finally giving us a run for our money, which honestly makes me want to win even more as Bubba Thompson is going against the pitch out and beats it. The go-ahead run is on second, but more importantly, we're immune to double plays, so we're very lucky that Bubba stole that base and kept the inning going because now he's gonna score. Now it's time for the best closer in all of baseball, and Mr. Tick may not throw gas, but his numbers back it up as he is leading the whole league in saves, and that was a beautiful top corner pitch to put him away. That was absolutely disgusting, and if we look at the stats, you'll see that that is what he's done all year long, putting together a ridiculous line. This is gonna be a very interesting draft because it marks the first time of the series that we're picking sort of near the middle, so as far as my plan for the first round goes, I'm kind of just gonna take the best available player. On one hand, it looks like Lincoln Ortiz is gonna be a very good player, but as you probably know if you watch enough of these videos, I'm not usually a fan of first round pitchers unless they're the Griffin Judd or Mac Badger type, so Adrian Barden is probably my top target. Don't get me wrong, Ortiz is definitely tempting, but this is a loaded starting pitcher draft from front to back, with plenty of non-ranked options that could be there in later rounds. And on the flip side of that, position players are much harder to come by, so I'm gonna value them much more. The Red Sox are gonna make my choice a lot easier, taking Ortiz right in front of me. So our first selection is gonna be Adrian Barton, and I really hope he's good. Now it's time to cash in on the LJ Morales Rookie of the Year draft pick. And unfortunately, just a few selections after we took Barton, my favorite option went off the board. After not taking Lincoln Ortiz, I really wanted Owen Eldridge to fall down the board, but that was not gonna happen. And because these other starters really don't look that great, I'm going for the safest pick you can do in MLB The Show in a high potential closer. While losing another starting pitcher certainly stings, there's so many options left on the board, but the same thing really cannot be said for position player guys. I would not be surprised if some of these guys 
guys got overdrafted since that's kind of just how the game works, so I'm not taking any chances going for a high potential third baseman. Even though we have a lot less information on undrafted catcher Damian Parker, our scouts think he's going to be really good, but as you can see, he's unranked and since he's already lasted this long, I think it's fair to say not many people know about him. Because of that alone, I'm going to draft Henry Delgadio just because of his high potential rating, as this is a very weak position player class, so I want to make sure we make the most of it. Just like you almost always see in MLB The Show, every single discovery pitcher is still on the board and probably will be until round 5 or 6. So even though Damian Parker is still on the board, it might be time to start bulking up at that position. Now in round 4, we are wasting no more time going after our guy Damian Parker. And one of the many reasons I love MLB The Show is because you can still find really good prospects late in the draft. And here is another one, Britt Hogg. It is time for our final pick where we could take another starter, but I think there's an even more interesting option in Blair Blanchard, who might not be as valuable as a starter just because he's a closer, but he's ranked as the sixth best player in the class, so I really cannot pass him up. Once again, MLB The Show did not generate a lot of very intriguing position players, but I still feel like we made the most of this class. And aside from landing Mac Badger last year, I feel like that class was far inferior compared to this one. We have already acquired so much top talent in the draft, especially our first one, as that class gave us Doug Forsyth, William Trout, Griffin Judd, and James Nanook. But one of the players that's been forgotten from that first draft is Nelson Wang. He's already a very good player, and I feel like the only reason he's not up yet is we really don't have a roster spot for him, as Dyron Blanco is regressing very fast, but is still putting up good enough numbers and is fast enough to stay on the team. Speaking of our team, it should surprise nobody that Griffin Judd and Mac Badger are both starting in the All-Star game, along with Jose Suarez and Avi Tick. That is great news, but to my surprise, that's actually where our representation stops, because no one else on our team, and specifically our offense, made the cut. I really thought that Doug Forsythe's career year was gonna get him into the game, and if not him, at least William Trout, who may have started slow, but he has been on fire lately. He is leading our team by far with 23 home runs, but then LJ Morales tops him with 60 RBIs, so I really don't know why we didn't have any offensive players represent us. I am ready to cruise straight through the rest of the season and into the playoffs, but it should not be surprising the second half starts with a little drama. We've been in this situation many times before, so just like always, we're counting on Avi Tick to get us out of it, but this time we might not be so lucky as runners are at the corners, but Forsyth makes a great play, the flip to second, and back to first gets us the win. That victory was by the skin of our teeth, and that does make me kind of nervous because we had a huge collapse in the second half last year, and I'd like to do anything I can to prevent that. This year, the trade deadline is a huge opportunity to put us over the edge, and I see one player I'm very interested in. The Boston Red Sox are looking to sell, and Kyle Teal's a perfect candidate because looking at their roster, they have 21-year-old Ethan Salas in front of him. Teal is a solid backup catcher who could develop into something greater, and because our catching situation with Freddie Tallieri and Corey Lee has been a little inconsistent, we could use a high ceiling upgrade. Because he's already 26 years old, this will not cost much as a solid pitching prospect gets it done. I think more than anything, that's just preparing for the future, and while a lot of fans probably wanted to see a bigger splash at the deadline, that is the best we're going to get with our budget and the fact that the rentals didn't really fit. We end July by sweeping Seattle, and while that's very exciting, I think the best part about starting the month of August is we can finally see our draft picks. Out of all the drafts we've done in this series, this one definitely had the best value picks, especially later in the draft. So without further ado, we're gonna check it out. That's a lot of blue. This is exactly why you should discover players every single week, because that is how I got the entire back half of my draft. And to all of you who joke in my comments that I draft better in the late rounds than the first round, this is exactly why. Adrian Barden obviously is not a flashy first round pick, but he's everything we thought he was gonna be. And in a class where position players were pretty dry, this is huge. I do want to see if he's better than Lincoln Ortiz, who was my other option, and even though he got snatched right in front of me, he did not sign. Looking at the other selections, it's kind of weird to say that's the best selection we could have made in that spot, and the same goes for closing pitcher William Park. I drafted two closers last year, but that was not going to stop me from getting another one, and then after that, I swear this position player class was so bad on paper that I just drafted the only high potential guys I could. Don't get me wrong, these guys have a pretty low shot of making the majors with 
all-star team, but these type of players are always useful as you get further into the franchise and more into trading. The only players who stayed on my board after that were all Discovery guys, and I'm so glad I hoarded up on them because they're all very good. Honestly, I'm a bit disappointed in Juan Rivera, who was supposed to be a top 10 player in the class, and with a walks per nine like that, he's gonna need a lot of development, but we certainly made up for it two selections later, taking Britt Hogg, who's not only a higher overall, but also comes in with 96 potential. Guys like him are the biggest reason I discover players, but maybe my favorite pick of the draft is Damian Parker, because I've tried discovering position players, but he's really the first one in this series that has been good. I got kind of greedy at the end taking another closer, but I'm certainly glad I did, because Blair Blanchard was the best possible way to cap off this draft class. By the way, just a reminder to not get too attached to these names, because they are going to change next episode based on your submissions in the comments below. I'm also very curious to know where you think this draft class stands among the other ones of the series, because while we did go for some safer picks than normal, it really paid off. It feels like every single close game we jump into is very competitive, and I really feel like this team's resilience has the entire nation rooting for them. In just five seasons, the Alaska Polar Bears have gone from a laughing stock to a perennial World Series contender, and it seems their MLB best record makes them the favorite. They remind me of the real-life Seattle Mariners with a good offense, as this game against the Rays marks the first time they've been to extras in a while. I am so glad we have the speedy Bubba Thompson on base as two sack flies is gonna score him, and every so often, that is all you need to win a baseball game. A lot of you have asked for hour-long episodes, but with the way we're playing this season, that really doesn't seem necessary, as it's certainly difficult to create drama when you're 23 and a half games up in your division. Maybe our final goal of the year is to win 116 games, but as you can see, that is not going to be easy, because a losing skid to start September sends us off our pace. However, standing on business against Houston can get us win number 100, as Kyle Teal, our brand new acquisition, goes deep, and while it's going to be caught, it does allow the runner to tag up, but he's not very fast, and that throw comes in in time. Funny enough, aggressive base running might be our biggest weakness, but just as we've seen all season long, Mac Badger is absolutely cooking. He made it to the top of the Rookie of the Year race and has not looked back ever since, and now Tyler Locklear's 21st bomb of the season is gonna help us close him out. While our team's chasing 116 wins, Griffin Judd is also chasing the MVP and the Cy Young, and from the start of the year, Avi Tick has not wavered from the top spot of Reliever of the Year. No matter how we play, I really don't see those awards changing, so I'm gonna go ahead and simulate to the end of the season, and despite a great effort, we fall short of 116 wins. We missed out on the all-time win record by two games in what was a magical season, as we went from not even making the playoffs last season to adding an extra 30 wins and becoming the best team in baseball. Of course, there were many reasons for our success, but probably the biggest one was this pitching duo between Griffin Judd and Mac Badger. The older of the bunch won his first Cy Young Award at age 25, as our closer Avi Tick led baseball with 60 saves that is ridiculous. Then for the second year in a row, we earned another draft pick because Mac Badger won Rookie of the Year, so across the board, the Polar Bears really showed out, especially our pitching rotation. They may not be the highest overalls on paper, but Mike Soroka had a redemption bounce back year, while late round draft pick Tristan Rodriguez has very quietly been one of the most undervalued players on the entire team. In the bullpen, Jose Suarez had another excellent year, but this time he was joined by James Nanook, who was just as good. So once again, it was not just the rotation, but also this bullpen that really held it down. Pitching wins championships, but our offense was also more than capable of picking up its slack, as they may have been middle of the pack in batting average, but were way up there in runs scored. Key guys from our first two drafts like LJ Morales, William Trout, and Doug Forsyth emerged as the true stars, but also our season one offseason additions fail to go away as Tyler Locklear, Joe Adele, and Bobby Dahlbeck all made significant contributions. All that is just to say that we had a magical season, and now I'm looking forward to the playoffs. Our first playoff opponent ever are the New York Yankees, who have invested significantly in their rotation, and with Aaron Judge and Anthony Volpe leading their offense, this should be a pretty significant challenge. Nothing would be more embarrassing than losing our first playoff series ever after having the best record in baseball, but it's not looking good early on as they score two runs off of Griffin Judd, and in case 
case you need a reminder, he just won the Cy Young Award. Right away though, there's runners at the corners for our slugger William Trout, who does fly out, but scores our first run. So I'm feeling a little bit more confident, but maybe I shouldn't. LJ, what are you doing, man? That is so embarrassing, but it's time for Griffin to lock in. Because while it may be arrogant, I have no doubt we're the best team in the playoffs. We just need a chance to show it. Every scoreless inning makes me so nervous, especially considering our number one pitchers going up against their number three, so we need a win. So far, we have only hit two singles off McKenzie, so it's only a matter of time until New York scores again, and there it is. Considering how many save chances Avi Tick had, this offense really struggles to produce a lot of runs, as we're in inning number six, and I feel like we've been watching fly balls all day. We are down by two and really need a hero, but Anthony Volpe just robs LJ Morales of another single. So it's now the bottom of the seventh, and we are running out of time, but thankfully that dive is gonna give Tyler Locklear a triple. That is the big break we've been waiting for, and now Joe Adele is gonna make it a one-run game, as Tristan McKenzie is finally out of the game, so we can really break down their walls. All we need is for our bullpen to hold up strong, and I feel like our advantage in that area of the game alone could be enough to win us the series. Our bullpen won us so many close games this season, so while this is definitely nerve-wracking, I feel like we're in a pretty familiar situation, as we have a chance to win the game right here, but Kyle Teal can't make good contact. That means our first playoff game ever is going to extra innings, and we're counting on Dre Jameson, who's still dealing. We are so close to a beautiful walk-off victory, and getting Blanco on base is a big deal, as he's gonna do his thing. This pitcher is now in a very high-stress situation, but here we go, Doug Forsythe. That is great contact. Giddy up, over the wall, and goodbye. That is a walk-off two-run shot to end our first playoff game ever, and that might have been one of the most exciting games of the entire year. We really waited for that type of contact all game long, and we finally got it when it mattered. So now the rookie, Mac Badger, is facing Dylan Cease. Mac is one of the best strikeout pitchers in all of baseball, but there's no doubt Dylan Cease is a worthy opponent, so getting two guys on base early on is a big deal unless they turn the double play. Our offense waited way too long to wake up in game number one, so I'm looking for an early score, because our rookie pitcher needs some run support, but of course we are off to another slow start. I should not be surprised, but Badger is dominating this lineup, so game number two may very well be decided by which starter breaks first. Finally a big play as Adele doubles with two outs, so deadline pickup Kyle Teal can be a hero, but that changeup is nasty. Compared to the rest of his arsenal, that pitch is painfully slow, so amazingly we are still looking at goose eggs in the sixth inning. Mac is going toe to toe against a seasoned vet, and if we can win this game, he may need a statue as Joe Adele's going to right field and finally rewards him with a solo shot. This man is a pending free agent who's too expensive to bring back, so I'm definitely gonna miss him, but there's no doubt he's left it all on the field today with his third hit of the day, and that was the biggest yet. It finally feels like we're breaking through their starting pitching, and the elevation is gonna carry this. Kyle Teal sending it way back to the wall, and it is gone. There's a dinger for Kyle Teal, and once again, I feel like their bullpen's their biggest weakness, as that was a three-run inning, and Badger's still holding the shutout. New York is almost on our level, but missed the mark, and throughout the year, I've constantly wondered what this team would look like without Mac Badger, and I think it's pretty clear we would be nowhere near as good. I'm gonna sim one more game, and there's the W, but our next opponent, the Baltimore Orioles, may be our biggest challenge yet. These guys are absolutely loaded with Jose Alvarado and Ozzy Albies, so unlike New York, they might have enough firepower to break through our starting pitching. So above all else, if we want to win, we gotta score some early runs. We certainly have the advantage in game one, going up against Robbie Snelling, who's only an 80 overall, as we already have runners at the corners with one away. William Trout smokes this to center field, going, going, and gone. That is easily our best start ever, and Griffin Judd is locked in, as he would go on to pitch a complete game shutout in a victory where no runs were scored after the first inning. All I'm realizing is starting pitching makes all the difference in these playoff games, even though Badger's off to a rough start. And after being shut out, Baltimore's bats have woken up. We lost our first playoff game of the season, and if our offense can't recorrect this ship, we're gonna be in huge trouble. Right now, we're being one hit by an 80 overall pitcher, and just two games after shutting them out, we're on the receiving end. The very frustrating thing for me is on paper, I feel like we're the more complete team, but in game four, we just got unlucky as a very good pitcher got shelled. I really can't 
recall Tristan Rodriguez giving up six runs in his whole career. So right now, it feels like elimination is very likely and our season is over. After that Yankees series and game one, I really thought we were going to make it further, but we lost four straight games to end our year. And even though we're certainly going to be back, it seems like we caught a very good team at a bad time. Along with that, we're facing our most pivotal offseason yet as Joe Adele's contract is expired and he's played his last game as a polar bear. In addition to that, while Dyrone Blanco does have another year left on his deal, regression has hit him so hard that I honestly can't tell you if he's going to be back next season. When you're playing as a franchise with no spending capital, this is when you have to start making some very tough decisions and the very unfortunate reality of being on a short financial leash is that any move I make from here on out can either take us to the World Series or hold us back again. Once again, if you did enjoy this video, please drop a like and subscribe because we're entering the brutal months of winter for the algorithm and it would literally save me. Also, click right here to see more of my content and have a nice day.